Good afternoon, everyone, and very welcome to today's seminar. Uh, it's my honor to present Rasha Kirakosian, who will be giving today's lecture. When arriving here at the Collegium as a fellow, she was associate professor of German and the study of religion at Harvard University. But after completing her fellowship here, she will take up the position as professor of medieval German at the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg. Russia Kirokosian received her doctorate degree in philosophy from the University of Oxford in 2014, where she was a Marie Curie Research Fellow for three years. Following her degree, she was a lecturer at the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages in Oxford, lecturer at Somerville College, Oxford, and director of studies for German at Oriel College, Oxford. She then moved to Harvard University to take up the position as assistant professor of German and religion. She has enjoyed scholarships from the European Commission, Le Conseil Régional d'Ile de France, Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes, and the German History Society, among others. Kirakosian was awarded the Harvard Medical School's William F. Milton Award for her research on Gertrude the Great. And she has obtained numerous other stipends, such as the Herzog Ernst Research Scholarship of the Fritz Thyssen Stiftung, a Gerda Henkel Research Fellowship, and a Huntington Library Mayor's Fellowship. In March and April of 2017, she was invited to a research residency as the director's visiting scholar at Dunbarton Oaks, Washington, DC. Now, Kirakosian's publications include studies on medieval German mysticism, female sanctity, and medieval law. A recurring theme is the, the striving to bring forward voices that may have been lost in the waves of history. And I believe this is also going to be the theme for today's lecture. Her first monograph, Die Vita de Christina von Hane, Untersuchung und Edition, published by de Greuter in 2017, deals with the biography of a 13th century pre-Monstratensian mystic, the pre-Monstratensians being a Roman Catholic religious order. Christina of Hane is a unique and little known mystic, and Kirakosian's book was the very first comprehensive study on the late medieval text transmitting her life, Vita. She's also the translator of the life of Christina of Hane into English, a book which is still, I believe, forthcoming. Another forthcoming book explores the German reception of the visions of Gertrude of Helfta's Legatus Divine Pietatis. Gertrude of Helfta being a German Benedictine nun, also a mystic, a theologian, theologi theologician, sorry, <laughs> recognized as a saint. A look at her publication list reveals that from a clear focal point of interest, she explores adjacent fields, and I would like to mention two examples of articles. One being the last empress, Saint Richgard and the end of the Carolingian dynasty, which is accepted for publication in Women's History Review. And the second I'd like to mention is entitled Musical Heaven and Heavenly Music at the Crossroads of Liturgical Music and Mystical Texts by Viator, published in 2017. But Kirakosian also explores and contributes to preservation and renewal of empirical findings. For example, with her students, she is currently developing digital editions of medieval legends of Mary Magdalene. And here at SCAS, she conducts research on women's history in medieval Europe and the theatricality of visions. So please welcome Russia Kirikosian. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you all for coming so um, humorously, and thank you, Christina, for this far too flattering um, introduction. 
Now you've all seen the title, if not, you have a chance to see it here again. Um, there are many types of historical inquiry and they follow different hierarchies of evaluation. Archives, like cultural and religious ideas, are, quote, subject to processes of do domestication and integration into the cultural mainstream of a given civilization, end quote, to, to use Björn Wittrock's words. Despite the fact that quite often we are faced with the paucity and uncertainty of source material, archives remain centers of institutionalized knowledge and they shape our thoughts about the world. Whoever controls the archives controls the view of the past. In my next project, I aim to launch a series of booklets which tackle the countercurrents of historiography by unearthing and or reassessing archival material and presenting original topics. As a little foretaste, I would like to bring forward the story of Katharina of Württemberg and her spiritual community of Adelberg and later Laufen. Towards the end of my talk, I shall come back to the methodological implications of my undertaking, that is the series of books, which is called Discrete Archives. On Thursday, the 10th of May, 1488, Pope Innocent VIII issued a bull in which he demanded the return of the fugitive Countess Katharina of Württemberg to her religious community, a Promitzitensian women convent in Laufen. But she would never be reintegrated. Instead, she found refuge at different places until she spent her final years in the city of Würzburg. What drove her to escape her community, which had just recently been separated from the male convent of Adelberg? How did her family, the leading family of Württemberg, react to her deviant behavior? What kind of impact did political and religious developments had on her life? The personal fate of Countess Katharina of Württemberg is closely tied up with the history of her religious order. Here, biography and institutional history are intertwined. Two aspects that her life needs to be seen in relation to are inheritance issues with her, within her family and the late medieval religious reform movement, which in the latter half of the 15th century gained momentum, meaning in practice that women in convents were now supposed to be cloistered, and that means to be cut off from the outside world. In order to understand Katharina's turbulent life, we need to address the history of her religious community and the role women played in it, we will look at the observant movement, that is the religious reform movement in which women convents had to be cloistered. And finally, we will look at an inheritance dispute in which Katharina was entangled. Now, the word has already been mentioned by, Christi by, by Christina, Primonsetensian. It sounds like a tongue twister. It comes from the uh, first, the word comes from the first house, the first foundation in Primontré, so Primonsetensians. Um, who were founded in 1120 by Norbert of Xanten as a religious community of clerics that welcomed, especially welcomed women into a spiritual vocation. So double monasteries were established all across Western Europe in which canons and canonesses worshipped more or less together, albeit in separate convents, thus practicing some sort of a cooperative spiritual program as Fiona Griffith and Julie Hodgson have pointed out. Canons are the male members of the order, who are also clerics, as they follow the Augustinian rule. The female members of the order are therefore called canonesses. In the Middle Ages, women of the Primensitensian order were, strictly speaking, not nuns, because their status brought one legal freedom. Their religious vows did not include the vow to poverty, meaning that they had a right to private property which in the Middle Ages often took the form of a private building, a pension, or a maidservant. Such relative liberties were increasingly criticized by clerics. The maintenance of double monasteries, which were both praised and condemned by contemporaries, generally declined over the centuries. And I invite you, if you're interested in this topic, to come to a workshop on the 26th of February at Uppsala University Histories Department with my colleague Louise Berklund. We're going to talk about the practice of double monasteries in late medieval Europe, and our workshop is, will be perhaps entitled Double Trouble. <laughs> 
So 26th of February, 1 p.m. was it, Louise? 1.15 p.m. Because you see, double monasteries by the late Middle Ages were not supposed to exist, and yet we have a whole order, the Bridgerton order, that is founded as that, with that principle. Permanent attendance at double monasteries, that is places where male and female convents were maintained together, continued to exist until the late Middle Ages. And here's a map of the Swabian houses. Um, so those with the cross in here, the square with the cross, is a Primozetensian double monastery. This is Adelberg. This is Roggenburg, Marstal, Kloster Roth, Weissenau. Yeah. And this is the county of Württemberg. Investigation of the Swabian houses, one of which was located in the country of Württemberg, Adelberg, though not necessary under the Count's direct rule, reveals an array of practical solutions arranged for the topography of double monasteries. Because the question arises, how do you actually keep men and women who are supposed to live a religious life on the same ground? And these, in these different houses, each double monastery found a different solution. Besides the convents Roth and Roth an der Roth, where you can already see here the dynamics within the map that they split up and the women were transferred to Haslachtal eventually. Then we've got Weissenau and Ravensburg. Um, we've got Marstal um, and Adelberg deserves our closer look. Adelberg lasted as a double monastery until the second half of the 15th century when the female convent was detached from the male and transferred to Laufen. So here's Adelberg, the women get transferred to Laufen. So that Adelberg becomes a male convent in the, by 1476. The major initiator for this move was Count Ulrich V of Württemberg, whose only child, born of first marriage, Katharina of Württemberg, happened to be a canoness affected by the splitting of the convents of Adelberg. And this is not in a, a sign for polygamy here that you see. This is the three uh, consecutive wives. <laughs> and this is Margarete von Kleve, which we can tell by her coat of arms, of course. And this is the mother of Katharina, is Ulrich. The general view held in history on Primatetens and double monasteries is that they were formally abolished by the early 13th century. In Adelberg, however, canons lived on the same convent ground as canonesses for much longer. Adelberg was founded in 1178 as a double monastery. The prevalent narratives and research are that the women of the convent had been quiet and were uninvolved in the affairs of the monastery and that after the separation of the convents, the male one experienced its intellectual heyday. Investigation into the transmitted acts and deeds concerning Adelberg show, however, that women partook in the convent's economic life. We find, for example, a certain sister called Agnes Priseren, who took on a major role in a financial transaction. In a contract from 1291 and a follow-up document from 1293, which we see here, she transferred money on behalf of a canon, and by doing so, she secured herself personal financial and spiritual advantages. And down here you see her name, Agnes Soror Briseren. Yeah? And she's mentioned a couple of times. She used the same contract as an opportunity to confirm her rights, insisting on her privilege to use the interest gained from the purchased property for a brother during her lifetime and leaving it to the convent only after her death. Furthermore, she sets the condition that after her death she should be remembered as much as any other canon. Now the important background for this is the practice of memoria. This is the main justification for the existence of monks and nuns, that they pray for the souls of the deceased to, give, to, to make their passage into eternal life easier. Yeah? So she insists that her soul will be remembered and, and it's specified in, m in masses 
that is with Eucharist, in prayers and vigils, as much as any brother. And this gives us a clue that probably that, that means this is not mirroring reality. That means she had the need to ask for this, right? With Agnes claims, we see the desire for arranging a spiritual equality between men and women. As this was certainly not reality. We know that women of the order did not get the same economic or sacramental space. Nonetheless, with Agnes, we get a sense that Primantzatensian women attempted to improve their situation, their spiritual and economic standing, and that was via economic transactions. Economic aspects cannot be underestimated when trying to assess the women's agency. Another document from the 1st of December 1307 tells us that Siegfried Colley, mayor of Rechberghausen, and his wife Agnes donate a house and garden complete with equipment to the Adelberg canons for the salvation of their souls. Again, practice of memoria so that they will be remembered. In the same document, we find out that um, Agnes and her, and so this is Agnes, Siegfried Colley's wife, and Siegfried Colley, that they actually had been generous to the order before. So we find out that they had given to the lay brothers, that means the brothers that are not ordained as priests, five shillings on an earlier occasion. And this is absolutely normal in medieval deeds to, um, whenever you draw a new contract, to just reconfirm what you have already done, although there is an existing deed. There is, in a way, there is an awareness for um, the vulnerability of, of documents, right? One could read it like that. The general couple also specifies that as, as at an earlier occasion, the Primus in ladies, Frauven, that means the canonesses, had received 10 shillings. So the lay brothers had received five, the women twice as much. The order in which the different members are called in this document, first the canons, then the lay brothers, finally the women, speaks to the internal hierarchy. Yeah? Even though the monetary values are different, the monetary value amount for the women was the highest, but their status was not affected by it. And this is mirrored in the fact that they are mentioned last. Primatsetensian women continue to be active in financial matters. I found more than a handful additional transaction deeds from 1369 to 1413. Women of, of the order belong to the regional nobility. We can be certain that many, if not most of them, were financially well off and sustained good networks outside the convent. Being together with male canons secured a certain lifestyle, both spiritually and worldly. Spiritually, the presence of many priests guaranteed a devotionally inspiring program. Yeah? In worldly terms, with its vast property holdings needing management and its political network to other convents, Adelberg was a place of personal exchange where many visitors were passing by. Although technically women were to be kept away and hidden, and only visited by priests in the company of a couple of lay brothers. The canonesses most certainly profited from the coming and going of people. And we can imagine that the canonesses would find out if their cousin or some friend of the family vis would, would visit, and so they would write a letter and make sure that he'd get the letter on his visit to Adelberg, and that person may have replied the same day. So this is the kind of exchange that they profited from, although they were supposed to not go and stand at the, at the gate of the monastery and go like, hey, cousin, or something. That was not the kind of personal exchange we're talking here, but they certainly profited from it. It may then not come as a surprise that the process of splitting the convents was not straightforward and certainly not met without friction and resistance. The major initiator of this move was Count Ulrich V of Württemberg. Ulrich is known for his zeal to reform all of the monasteries in his dominion, but most of them were not under his direct rule, so that in some cases reform took several years. Already in the 1450s, Ulrich targeted the Dominican nunnery in the geostrategically important town of Laufen. So there is Laufen, which is actually just at the border of his county, which means, and it runs by, it is by a river, so it's, it's geostrategically very important. It's a, it's, it's a place where, where people pass, yeah? 
So it, it, it's a place where people can come into his county and um, therefore this is actually quite an important place. So his plan was to reform the Dominican nunnery of Laufen. But local nobility reminded him of their privileges, which they saw endangered through Ulrich's reform. Then, on the 6th of March in 1459, Ulrich obtained a papal approval from Pius II for the reform of Laufen. But the Palatinate War put the project on ice for six more years, until in 65, the Count announced to not only reform Laufen, but also to renew its spirit by transferring the women of Adelberg to it. In fact, by the 1460s, there only remained one Dominican nun in Laufen, so that Ulrich's initiative seemed to be a good willing effort to prevent Laufen from being shut down altogether. But the abbot of Adelberg disagreed with the translocation, and so did his order. Mobilizing their constitutional position, they had both Pope and Emperor, so that's Paul II by now, and Frederick III, confirm their freedom and immunity as they had been in independent convents since the time of their foundation in the 12th century. The Count, however, did not give in and played the long game. A series of political moves strengthened his reform position. In 1473, he installed the first Dominican male convent in his county and placed it in his capital, Stuttgart. Ah, there it is. Yeah. So he had the Dominic. He 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 places the first Dominican male convent into his capital. In 1475, the Viennese Jakob Fabri von Stubach, known to be a networker and reformer, became the provincial of Teutonia. That is the area of uh, the German uh, the, the, the German Dominican convents, and within five years only. Jakob Fabri managed to reform all the German Dominican nunneries. Now, I hear you say, but the Primacetensians are not the Dominicans, right? Of course they are separate, but the Dominicans were the order at the forefront of reform, and Ulrich knew that he needed their support to reform the women convent of Adelberg, partly because they would be transferred to a formerly Dominican nunnery, but also because of a rising social pressure about Adelberg's status as a double monastery at a time when women convents were to be enclosed. So imagine, this is a time when all across Northern Europe, women convents get, that, that often were in cities, get to be placed outside the cities, get to be enclosed, so, so they get enclosed, so they get a wall built around them. Women are, who, who lead a spiritual life are not supposed to have contact with the outside world. In this times, Adelberg is led as a double monastery. Shocking. The Dominicans promoted cloistered nunneries. Adelberg, with its double monastery, was far from cloistering women. And indeed, it was criticized for the cohabitation of men and women. And here again, the deed that uh, Ulrich designs to have the women tr be transferred to Laufen. Now, this is a man you don't want to joke with. <laughs> So on the 4th of April, 1474, Pope Sixtus IV confirmed the formal dissolution of the double monastery of Adelberg in order to, quote, avoid scandals. Scandalis provideritur, which may stem from the mixed gender cohabitation. Now this, of course, is not necessarily a descriptive observation. It is not telling us about scandals, but it is a rhetorical move and an infallible argument in favor of the women's translocations. So preparations started following the papal call. There was no choice. Yeah, there was this papal bull. The women are going to go. In several convents and chancelleries, the decision for translocation was noted. Really, in the region and, and, and outside the region, we find in several convents a note for this day, Adelberg is going to be dissolved. Can you believe it? <laughs> And in Adelberg itself, the abbot and his female equivalent, called mistress among the Promocetensians, wrote charters in which they listed in detail what of the women convent's holdings would continue to belong to the women once they have transferred to Laufen. 
They also confirmed the ongoing supervision by the Adelberg canons. So although they would go to Laufen, their mother abbey so would be Adelberg. Yeah? Although I should really not say abbey because Benedictines have abbeys and Pomerantensians have stifts or monasteries. So the women be continued to report to the abbot of Adelberg. For example, no new woman was allowed to join Laufen without the abbot's approval. From my archival work on Abbot Bertolt Dürr, I got the sense that he honestly disliked the Count's intervention. He really didn't like the Count messing up with the affairs of the monastery. This document from 1473 is about a litigation between a farmer called Oswald Beck and the convent of Adelberg. Oswald Beck had appealed to, uh, against the abbot um, be because the abbot wanted to charge him lease and Oswald found that to be unfair. And the count, who is the judge for the reason, decided in favor of the farmer, in favor of Oswald. And uh, this had to be signed by all the parties, and was signed by all the parties. But Abbot Bertolt Dürer makes sure to tell us that der pure und große Schenk, die sie haben getan, und der gewaltigen Widerstand haben gemacht, dass ich diese Geschrift habe geschehen müssen, lohn. Contra voluntate mea. I was forced to sign this against my will. He's marking this on the back of the document that he has signed. He's marking here for posterity to his brothers and to everyone else, I did not want this. One of the outcomes of this distrust between the parties was that all deeds concerning the canonesses' translocation were meticulously documented and copied several times. This is an example of how conflict and disagreement in legal matters actually creates an archive. In a way, a lot of the history that retells the history of conflict. Fun times <laughs> with this charter. Yeah. This is the kind of legal, meticulous documentation that we're talking about. This charter from the 16th of January, 1478 is issued by Count Ulrich V and his son Eberhard VI, also called the Younger, Katharina's half-brother. Here they explain why the translocation had to happen and lay out the economic situation of the women convent, specifying what the male convent has granted and what they, the counts, are willing to donate. In a rhetorically loaded introduction, father and son emphasize their benevolence in light of mortality. Again, practice of memoria and light of mortality, yeah? In order to rescue the Dominican nunnery of Laufen, and since Adelberg is a, quote, male monastery with sundry traffic, end quote, and, quote, men and women shall not be disturbed in their pious devotion and exercise, end quote, they have decided to suggest the separation of the convents to the Pope, the Primoncetensian chapter, and the Dominican chapter that had to agree, of course, because they're going to a Dominican nunnery. So here we find very clearly this rhetoric also that men and women shall not be disturbed in their pious task, which is to pray, and implicitly that they will be disturbed if, they're suppo if they pray together, if they worship together. They then specify the economic standing, including their generous contribution to Laufen of 130 pound worth in corn, wine and money each year perpetually, and many other concessions. In the end, we are told that the new mistress of Laufen and all other women, including future generations, have no right to claim, e to claim anything else other than what is written in this charter from the abbot of Adelberg. So again, this Bertolt Dürer, the abbot, did want to make sure that there are no further claims. This letter of the counts is clearly demarcating the legal limits of the women's convent as they stress to have done everything for the better of the women, and yet protecting the interests of the abbot. Is this just a topos, or were they anticipating future claims by the canonesses? Were they fearing that the canonesses might actually want to have more? 
The key figure in the negotiations between the counts and the different convents is Katharina of Württemberg, Ulrich's only child of his first marriage with Margarete von Kleve. Before the events of the translocation, we find her first mentioned in 1462 in the convent of Adelberg. Several receipts in her hand are transmitted, and I always find it wonderful to actually have someone's individual handwriting. Just, there's just something about handwriting that makes you be closer to them. This is Katharina's hand. This is her paper seal. If this were now present in front of us, you could very clearly see her coat of arms. Um, and here she equips what she has received. Uh, 75 Pfund Haller Liebgeding. Liebgeding. That's her pension that is, uh, that, that is attached to her person. So she signs and confirms what she obtains from her father, in this case 75 gulden from 1466. She generally received 200 gulden annually, paid out in quarterly installments. This is very generous. Before the translocation, her father once more confirmed the continuation of this very generous pension. Furthermore, so when it's becoming clear that they're going to be translocated, the father adds, at this occasion, 50 more golden during special, special fast days, which occurred four times a year, virtually doubling her pension to 400 golden annually. He also granted her her mother's dowry, and literally, as it's written down, as much money as she desires to draw from the family treasury. The motivation for this magnanimity, Ulrich specified as, quote, paternal loyalty, love, and other reasons. Close quote. With this kind of inheritance, she was supposed to receive for the rest of her life her relative independence from the women convent was secured. Could it be that the ominous other reasons indicate Katharina's recal recalcitrance to move to Laufen? We know little about her life there, and she stayed there less than 10 years. Historiographical sources give us some hints, for example, an aquarelle from 1605 in which she is depicted to enter the new convent as the first person, which would suggest that she's the abbess, but she was not the abbess, and here's her seal. And uh, I would love to talk about this image in the discussion, so one of you should definitely ask more about this image. <laughs> and there's plenty to unpack in this, um, in, in this hi historicizing view of the event from 1605, yeah? Here yeah, the abbot is even twice in there. A report more closely to the event is narrated in the Convent Chronicle written by Prior Thomas Renner, who is also mentioned here. Bruder Thomas Renner Prior. He writes down, just shortly after the translocation, um, that a group of nine canonesses moved to Laufen on the 27th of August 1476. With them was also a lay sister, a Pfründnerin, which basically means that she was a personal asset of one of the canonesses. And we can see her actually here. She's not wearing the, nun the canonesses habit. Only two months later, the remaining eight sisters, among which was Katharina, followed. But Rena doesn't miss to give us the reason for why they followed two months later. Quote, not out of disobedience or rejection of the papal command, but with permission, they stayed longer in Adelberg. Close quote. Besides, the buildings in Laufen had to be renovated and decorated. Maybe for the countess. We are also told that the translocation was necessary because women and men lived within one cloister, which viewed from the outside world may seem indecent, although nothing suspicious would have ever occurred. This echo of the papal bull from the 4th of April 1474 leaves no doubt that Adelberg was considered to be a double monastery at a time. We can only imagine the new regime under which the women had to comport themselves. The priestly duties were delivered by one chaplain, but other than that, they were supposed to be live cloistered, meaning to be absolutely cut off from the outside world with zero mobility. I mean, to the degree where in order to receive posts, there was a little wheel in the wall, 
so that the so that at no point there would be a window to the outside world so you would put your post into that into that w wheel thing and then someone inside the, the who who and that also had to be uh, a special nun or in this case canoness who was allowed to operate the wheel <laughs> then would turn it and get the letter to this degree yeah they were cloistered so just imagine that zero mobility even with a priest on site the liturgical life was certainly not as rich as it was in Adelberg yeah what must this new way of life have been like for Katharina who had joined the monastic life as an adult she was nearly 21 when she had come to Adelberg and now she was nearly 35 and what was it like to be the daughter of the man who was responsible for imposing the strict observance on the entire community? One document, which I still need to study as it only came to my attention a few weeks ago, is a visitation report from 1478 kept today in the state archives of Sigmaring. Newly reformed women convents were usually visited by male supervisors in order to survey the compliance with the reform principles. So there is a report from 1478 about Laufen, and apparently we hear about serious deficiencies in the handling of the enclosure. So the supervisor criticized that the women were not actually sticking to the, to, to the enclosure, and this is why I de desperately want to study this report, of course. From other contexts, we know numerous cases of nuns leaving the monastic life because they didn't want to be enclosed. Nuns who turned their back to their former communities and had their properties be paid back to them. So even you know, if, if you were a nun who was supposed to be poor and you decided to leave the convent because you didn't want to be enclosed, you actually had the right to get whatever, you, whatever asset you brought into the convent and you can imagine that if that happened on a larger scale that that meant financial precariousness for the convents and that happened in Strasbourg to the Dominican nunnery St. Nicolaus in Undis. We do not know whether Katharina left Laufen for this particular reason and independent from the enclosure another problem had occurred. After her father's death, an inheritance dispute between Katharina and her cousin broke out. Her cousin, Eberhard the Older, was now count, and he was determined to bring the family's possessions and resources into order. Wars had depleted the treasury, and the girls in the family needed either ongoing support or dowries. And there were more girls and boys. So on the 3rd of March, 1487, Eberhard issued a document in which he authorizes legal representatives for Katharina, Adelberg and Laufen. So she decides who's going to be the, who's going to get power of attorney. In the matter of renunciation of inheritance demanding that Katharina, Adelberg and Laufen would give up all claims to her paternal, maternal, fraternal and cousin's inheritance in case the family could not produce a male heir. As a compensation, Laufen were to receive 1,000 gulden annually for 20 years. So 20,000 gulden. All other claims to Katharina's inheritance should be abolished. Eberhard knew of Katharina's generous inheritance granted by her father. And while her annual pension was not endangered through this new regulation, all the extras, her mother's dowry, her additional pension top-up, the possibility to draw as much money as she wanted, would be given up. Katharina had two half-brothers, one of whom was unlikely to have a child at all, and all other male grandchildren of Ulrich had so far died in childhood. So Eberhard, with this regulation, is, is, not, is not just fantasizing, it's not an hypothetical regulation, this m may very much happen. He considered the financial situation of the family as a whole and Katharina's heritage in his eyes needed to be cut in case no continuation of the line could be granted, as a consequence of which there would be no one who could manage the assets and the many financial duties that the family was liable for. Of course, an inheritance dispute may sound very dry to us today, but there was certainly some drama. Between February 1487 and May 1488, 
Katharina must have escaped her convent, causing so much ado that the head of the church was notified and found himself needing to act. And I just want to stress this. The Catholic Church is, at this age and time, the most powerful institution in Europe. It is vast. It has representatives in every part that is lived in and, and beyond. Yeah? It's a huge institution. And if the head of the institution intervenes, then it's serious. Yeah? So here's the papal bull from Innocent VIII, addressed to Adelberg and to other Primonsatensian convents, demanding the return of the fugitive canoness Countess Katharina of Württemberg. This is not a plea, this is a demand. You've got to return. Obedience. We are told that both Count Eberhard the Older and the convent of Laufen had approached the Pope with this plea. But Katharina did not return. Where was she? She had first found refuge with the Prince Bishop of Würzburg, Rudolf of Scherenberg. Laufen was located in his diocese. Then she found abode in the Primatetensian convent of Gerlachsheim. The overseeing abbot of Gerlachsheim, Christoph von Oberzell, wrote a petition to the abbot of Adelberg requesting to exempt Katharina of her vows. That means requesting him to exempt her of the vow of obedience. In other words, please stop forcing her to return. Christoph explains that she ran away from Laufen because of an inheritance dispute with the lords of Württemberg which also tells us that she didn't feel that Laufen or Adelberg would give her the kind of support that she needed. On the same day that Christoph wrote his letter, the 28th of January 1489, asking the abbot of Adelberg to exempt her from her vows, Katharina attempted to obtain a settlement in the matter herself. Issued in a chancellery in Stuttgart, in this legal document, she declares to renounce all claims to inheritance that go beyond her pension. She's, already, she's ready to make do with a one-off payment of 2,500 gulden in cash and 300 gulden pension annually. In addition, she asks for the interest and exemption from duty of her properties in Göppingen. She adds that she escaped Laufen because her inheritance was threatened. This is not everything. Katharina knows how to secure herself further, to create an archive, better copy things several times at several places. A few days later, on the 6th of February, 1489, she signs an agreement with the abbot of Adelberg and the mistress of Lauf, Margareta von Sachsenheim, making sure that they have no further claims to her pension or property. She tries to cut ties. Yeah. She still did not return to Laufen, but stayed in Gerlachsheim. An early modern copy of a contract from 1492, and you can see here 1492, this is, this is the copy of a contract. Again, um, early modern copy of an existing archive to make sure that documents are transmitted and preserved. Good archive practice. So in this contract from 1492, between the mistress of Gerlachsheim, Elisabeth Kressin, and Katharina, we're told that Katharina financed herself a building project on the convent ground, to build herself her own place on the convent ground, and that she lived on her own expenses, both concerning meals and accommodation. And it even says she would not cost, so that she would not cost the convent any money. She's buying her place in Gerlachsheim. In 1495, however, she must have left again. In this document, we are told that she didn't comply with the rules of convent life. She's getting more and more likable, isn't she? She's getting more and more sympathetic. <laughs> Then, the next message that reaches us is from the 22nd of August, 1497. 
This is actually a deed, uh, a, a property sales deed. Um, her half-brother Eberhard, the younger, sells the house and homestead in Würzburg, which he inherited from his late sister Katharina. I fancy to believe that she managed to live her final years in the city of Würzburg after she left Gerlachsheim, a city which was known to be accommodating for religious women in the 15th century. And here's a view of the late 15th century Würzburg and the Latin name Herbipolis. Katharina's final sit financial situation would have allowed her to lead an independent life in an urban environment, a virtually impossible life to lead for a single woman at the time. We get a sense, however, how hard she had to fight for it. She was probably buried in Adelberg. Katharina's life is difficult to reconstruct, but we know of it and we can tell her story. As a countess, she belonged to the 15th century who's who. As a canonist, she was very well educated and certainly knew her legal rights. Her networks and friendships enabled her to take a path unheard of in the Middle Ages, but whether she really liked it, whether she liked to take this path, is a different question altogether. What becomes apparent with her story is that the separation of double monasteries was not, as is often believed, a step towards emancipation leading into economic and legal independence from the male convents. And that's the master narrative about the dissolution of double monasteries. We cannot say whether the women welcomed the separation and translocation at all. In any case, it meant financial precariousness for the convents, for the female convents, because they had to renegotiate their economic situation. They had to move out, they had to build new buildings, among others, a wall. Most of the archival material that I've presented today comes from the state archives of Stuttgart, which is very neatly ordered. <laughs> at least for this shelf mark. Some other documents are kept in Karlsruhe, some in Würzburg. The chronicle I alluded to is kept in the Bavarian State Library in Munich, and I still need to go to Sigmaringen to study the visitation report from 1478. The story of Adelberg's archives is, as is the case with so many monastic libraries, entangled with the religious wars in the 16th and 17th centuries, Adelberg was dissolved in 1535, and there were two periods of restitution from 1548 to 1565 and 1630 to 1643. Only after the peace of Westphalia in 1648, the Adelberg archives were recuperated. Much had been lost. Swedish soldiers were responsible for some of that. Laufen's archives were dispersed after the convent's dissolution in the wake of the Reformation in 1553. Most of the material that I've gathered together is kept in separate, discrete folders at different places. They're often not catalogued on the item level. The painstaking work of going through these materials has revealed a great amount of women's interaction in economic affairs. These stories have not been told and so mainstream historiography still maintains an image of the women branch of the Primensitensian order as a most passive one. This misaligned perspective is then the basis for the view that the separation of the convents was a step towards more economic freedom, where in fact the opposite may be true. Reasons for why this master narrative developed are manifold, starting with what was documented and what wasn't, what was copied for posterity and what wasn't, and therefore was more prone to being lost, going over to the history of war and conflict, and finally the conscious creation of lasting archives and its management. And those of you who have come to hear about discrete archives will now get what they came for. While mo most of these factors, transmission, war, what's being recorded, etc., lie outside our area of influence, the archives that have survived need our critical attention, as it is here that we may unearth and reassess history.
They also need our critical attention from a different, more methodological perspective. This is where the book series Discrete Archives, Untold Stories from the Past comes into play. And for discrete archives, the pun is intended. Deliberations and conceptions of archives have increasingly been debated in academia and society at large. For once, because of the new opportunities and challenges posed by the digital age, but also due to the experience of what Derrida called archives of evil in more recent history. And Derrida in thinks in particular of the Stasi. He is an image of uh, the archives nowadays. It's also called the Bördler Behörde. Um, he's also thinking of the KGB and the Khmer Rouge. In Archive Fever, Mal d'Archiv, Jacques Derrida drew attention to the nomological principle of the Judeo-Christian origins of archives, as in arche, meaning both commencement and commandment, according to which order is installed by the divine authority through a covenant. As summed up by Julie Louise Bacon, quote, from early times we witness archiving both as an act of the imagination, whose landscape is represented in a set of traces on stone faces, and a form of social management, an attempt to bind how the inner world relates and is accountable to the outer world through the conception of a contract between the two." End quote. In the past decade, scholars have highlighted the historicity of archives, underlining that any story we may discern in the archives carries within itself the precondition and, again to say it with Julie Bacon, the background story of what we are able to see. The, quote, technical structure of the archiving archive, end quote, determines, said Terida, not only the content of what is archived, but also institutes the archivable event. In other words, it creates a relationship to the future in which this event can be recalled, and moreover, a controlling system of power through knowledge. Archives are thus both historically embedded and intrinsically dynamic. As speaking with Foucault, they belong to constructed spaces. As such, their shadow history is that of forgetting, of that which is not transmitted and lost, as Georges Didier Übermann and Knut Ebeling have pointed out. As we know, communication is a power tool. And here I want to actually refer to Christina Garsten's work in a totally different context, that of an ethnographic study of the World Economic Forum. Christina Garsten and Adrienne Sorbum have start stated that, quote, communication is the means by which organizations are designed, created, and sustained, and the base of power and authority, end quote. Archives are holders of knowledge, but only placeholders for powers, I want to argue, because their influence depends on how they are organized and how they are evaluated, and that is how knowledge is communicated. Nico Steyr observes that knowledge is nowadays often understood to be a form of processed or organized information, although knowledge and information, even despite William James' attempts to do so, are difficult to keep apart. Still advocating for a nuance between knowledge and information, Steyr writes that knowledge in a social environment enables agency. Wissen hat man nicht, Wissen ist eine Aktivität. Knowledge as the basis for economic growth is not only a phenomenon of the industrial and post-industrial era, the period Steyr is interested in. Archives as institutions where knowledge, where knowledge has been produced and organized have always been economic managerial enterprises, powerhouses of stro social structure. Whoever controls an archive controls the future, the future view of history. In this project, Discrete Archives, we look to complement the theory of archive through the methodological practice of reassessing discrete elements of archives, and this time discrete with double E, discrete elements of archives, caring for the hidden gems that for some reason or another, and these reasons often have to do with power structures, have gone unnoticed. As a consequence, new stories will be told, small, concentrated stories, historical vignettes, not unlike the ones Stefan Zweig recounts in his Sternstunden der Menschheit. Let me be clear. The series Discrete Archives is not about divorcing a microscopic view on history from a macroscopic one. 
Rather, it seeks to explore the tensions between micro and macro historical views through the lens of archival study. World history, or rather world histories, are not only incredibly attractive and inter interesting, they're also important as they explain, in the words of Björn Wittrock, transregional reorientations. Global narratives such as that of the Axial Age or Max Weber's history of religious societies have shaped the ways in which we view the world and moreover the ways in which we structure and organize knowledge about the world. Not shying away from major historical structures and developments in hoping to unlock the oftentimes implicit reactions and consequences of power and culture trajectories. Discrete Archives aims to diversify social historical science with a series of original, outstanding, yet exemplifying stories about single lives, circumstances, sources and artifacts. The historical contextualization of these stories means that they will engage with social, cultural and economic transformations. And I'm very happy to be collaborating with several colleagues on the larger book series, including Michael Pewitt. Our driving questions are, what regulates the mechanisms of archives? How do the processes of judging what is worthy of being remembered and transmitted evolve? How is it that certain documents and artifacts are stored, catalogued, exhibited, discussed, and others aren't? Of course, in many cases, sources have been lost to us due to natural catastrophes or simply decay. But there's more to the preservations of archives. They come with underlying power structures. They form our biases about what we are able to know. By telling stories different from those that come easily to us, long-standing and deep-seated cultural legacies may be challenged. On a more methodological level, with the set of explorations of individual archives, we may come closer to answering the question about what regulates the mechanisms of archives through discussing their administration as well as their accessibility. Discrete Archives is not about contesting or counter-proving schematic history. It is about multiplying the voices, and it is about raising the awareness for the processes of how knowledge is institutionalized, processes that are always linked to power structures. Foucault, too, sees the archive not as a unifying principle, but as one containing multiplicity. And with Discrete Archives, we aim to bring to light what is prone to be forgotten or descend, even worse, into a mythic past. And I want to close with this image um, from January 99. And the recent theory is that this, um, this is an image that was taken when the Stasi archives uh, uh, were, were attacked, you know, by, um, by uh, people of the peaceful revolution and um, and only recently the theory has been uttered that this might have been staged because, as we know, the Stasi was um, very much uh, uh, aware of the power of archives and they made sure to destroy everything that was, uh, was sensible and could uh, be discussed critically. So um, I find it very interesting that this is a recent theory that this must this might be actually a staged um, uh, destruction of the archives, but in any case it tells us a lot about the signal that one can send off with the destruction of an archive. Thank you very much.